Hey everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. Welcome to my kitchen. I'm happy to have you here with me today. As you can see, we are starting to make some progress getting our kitchen put back together. I have the cupboards lined and I have lined them with this really cute speckled liner. I just love the way it looks. It looks really vintage in the cupboards with this nice, beautiful vintage light sage green. And we have decided to go with copper hardware. So we're just waiting for the copper to come in before we put on the rest of the cupboards. Um, the reason that I just put the drawers in is just so I don't have the big gaping holes there. They're not actually filled with anything yet. I don't want to be using them until we have the, ha the hardware, the handles actually on the drawers. I'm just worried that with everyone opening them with their hands like this, we're going to end up scraping the paint along the bottom. The paint is fairly fresh and I would really like it to cure for at least a week before we start handling them too much, but it just looks so much better with the drawers in. And one of the things that I'm really happy about is the color that I had on here before was a very dark blue green and you weren't able to see the inlaid part of the drawers as much. And I think you can see it better with this lighter color. And I really love it so, so much. And we've made a decision about the countertop. So before I was talking about leaving our old 1970s countertop here, um, probably until the middle of the winter and then deciding what we want to do with it at that point. But we were talking about it this morning and we have decided that we are going to go with a butcher block countertop, the same as the Island that we have over here. Originally, we were kind of hesitant to do that because there is a lot of water mess that happens around our sink and we were worried that it was going to end up swelling and not looking really nice. But uh, what we have decided to do is put a farmhouse style sink here and those generally have like kind of an apron on the front and preferably if we could find this some drip, drip pardon me, <laughs> some drip racks on either side to keep the water contained. Um, but the other thing is, is that the butcher block countertops are actually relatively inexpensive in comparison to other options. So we thought even if we put it on and it lasts for several years, then that's good enough because eventually what we would like to do is put a new kitchen in. Uh, this kitchen was built in the 1970s and we've actually done a lot of upgrading on it uh, since we moved here eight and a half years ago. These are actually just plywood panels and we put these boards around the edge just to give it a little bit more visual interest, but it's probably going to hold up for another five years or so, but then I think it's going to be <laughs> done. So we are just going to limp it along until that point, but still have it look cozy and beautiful and not to break the bank. So we are going to put the butcher block countertop. And one of the things that we're going to do that I am personally really excited about is we're actually going to put the countertop sitting right on top of this countertop. And Dan is going to create some type of fascia for it. Uh, the reason that I'm happy about that is I am just about five, nine and we made this countertop over here a lot higher than that one, at least a couple of inches higher. And I find it so much easier to work here than I do over on the lower counter. So we're going to lift that up. I'm super excited about that. Um, one of the things that we are going to end up having to do is to lift the stove up a little bit so that it matches with the countertop and Dan has some ideas how he can do that. So it will look visually appealing. And I showed you in the last video that we're going to use these bright white subway tiles for the backsplash and they were really inexpensive. Dan was able to get three boxes of them. I can't remember for how much, but it was really cheap. And then the last thing that we're going to do, and this is something I'm really looking forward to is beside the stove here, Dan's either going to build or we're going to see if we can find maybe like an antique shop or something like that, but a narrow, china cabinet here for right here. And I'd like to have a, a tall one. This shelf will just move over a little bit because it's actually off center right now as it is, but a nice tall one with a glass front door. And into that, I want to put all of the beautiful antique cookbooks that have been sent to me over the last year or so since I started cooking out of them. We're going to be cooking out of antique cookbooks again as we move into the winter months but they're so beautiful and I hate to have them just sitting on my bookshelf out of the way where I don't get to enjoy them. And then we also have some really cool antique kitchen gadgets 
that we want to be able to put in there and then with a light in it, I think it'll just look so beautiful. So this is probably gonna take us at least another month because we are in the middle of a whole bunch of other projects right now as well. But I don't mind slow and steady. It's going to look beautiful when we are all finished. So that's a little update on the kitchen. What we're going to make for dinner today is some stuffed spaghetti squash. These came right out of the garden and I haven't washed them yet, so we need to get these washed. I get asked often how we eat all of the squash that I grow, so I thought I would start sharing some of those recipes with you. So we're going to do that. I mentioned in my last video that I have not ever found a French bread recipe that I feel like is as good as bakery made French bread, which I absolutely love. It's one of my favorite breads. So I've decided to go on a hunt for the perfect French bread recipe. So we are going to start with the first one today and see how it is. And then we'll have that. I'll cut up that French bread and make some garlic bread to go with our stuffed um, spaghetti squash. So we're gonna do that. One of the other things that we need to do is go outside and plant a few more cloves of garlic. So when my garlic came in the mail, it was several weeks before it was the best time to plant. So I opened up all the boxes so that they wouldn't develop any mold and I stuck them in underneath the dresser in my bedroom. And when I was cleaning my bedroom a couple of days ago, I think it was day before yesterday, I found these two bags tucked in underneath the dresser. So this one is Chesek Red and this one is Northern Quebec. So I have broken up the bulbs into their individual cloves and we're going to go shove those into the ground. Fortunately, we did get a cold snap a week and a half ago and it was actually unusually cold for us, but it has now warmed back up again and I think the ground's not going to be frozen um, to the point where I can't actually poke some holes and get these in the ground. You want to plant your garlic before the ground freezes. That's the optimal way to do it, but when you're, when you're caught like I am <laughs> with a couple of extra cloves to stick in the ground, I'm just gonna wing it and hope for the best. So we need to get out and go get those planted. So remember a couple of days ago how I put, I, I experimented with putting some chocolates into the freeze dryer. Even though I know that straight up chocolate doesn't freeze dry well, these were more like candy bars, Kit Kat, Crispy Crunch, and a couple other ones that are mostly candy with just a little bit of chocolate. So I put those in the freeze dryer and then my kids decided to throw a bunch of Halloween candy into the freeze dryer as well. Um, we managed to find a whole bunch of candies. I wonder if I have any packages. I'll look and see that I do if I do, but they don't have any dyes in them and they, they of course have sugar in them, but they don't have a lot of the dyes in them that I try to stay away from. So we freeze dried some of those and I can hear my freeze dryer beeping downstairs. So we're going to bring those up and check those out. I actually haven't gone down to see yet. A couple of the kids said that some of the candies swelled up really big. So that'll be fun. So maybe we'll start with pulling those out of the freeze dryer so that I can defrost my drip freeze dryer. It needs a good cleaning and get my next load in there. And then we will make our French bread and then we'll head outside. Okay, so we did all of the marshmallows that I had left over for when we were making those treats. And these gummies did not freeze dry. So they are kind of um, like they shatter when you bite them. They did not freeze dry. So I'm not entirely sure what happened with that because those should have poofed up quite a bit. So I can tell you right now why you should not freeze dry <laughs> chocolate. So the ones that were the crispy crunch, or no, yes, these were crispy crunch that have all the candy in them. Those actually swelled up the way that they should have. But because there's a heating process involved in the freeze drying process, you can see that a lot of the chocolate just melted off of these. So that's okay, my kids will still have fun picking off those. So I will try these. Crispy Crunch are actually my favorite chocolate bar. So we'll try this. That's tasty. I still wouldn't re recommend freeze drying them because like I said, all the chocolate actually melted off them, but the inside part is absolutely scrumptious. What do you guys think? Yeah, they kind of, they kind of are weird, but there are supposed to, like the gummies are supposed to kind of poof up and be like, be like freeze dried food. Sorry, so it kind of- like chocolate. I meant coffee. Yeah, there's a very coffee kind of flavor to them, to it too, which I thought was a bit weird. I can't bite it. Yeah, they're really hard. Watch your teeth. 
The plan for these is to use them in hot chocolate. So I am going to put um, these in, I'll put half in mylar and half into a half gallon jar. If you are going to be freeze drying a lot, I would recommend getting one of these larger funnels. This is our milk funnel because you can actually just dump the whole tray right into here and have it go into the jar easily without making a big mess. So I'm going to do one that is going to just sit on the top of our fridge for hot chocolate. We do a hot, hot chocolate often throughout the winter time, so this will get used up in the next month. And then the other one I'm going to put into mylar and with an oxygen absorber. Whenever I am doing anything with oxygen absorbers, I try to cut it off right up at the very top. Grab the oxygen absorber that I need out of the little bag, throw that into my mylar, and then I seal this back up right away using my impulse sealer here that I got from Harvest Right. Actually, I'm just gonna throw one in this jar too. And then, so usually I put this one on around two. And then it's sealed right back up again and I don't end up losing all those oxygen absorbers because once they get exposed to the oxygen in the air, then the quality of them starts to degrade right away. So we're gonna pop a lid on this one and I'll pop this on the top of the fridge here. One of the other things that I do to make this easy, I'm not gonna bother right now because I only have the one bag, but is I use one of my tall pots and I set this in and then I can set this right on top and just dump everything in and it just makes it so much easier. And when you put your stuff in your mylar, if you just shake it down, it's amazing how much space you can save. This was filled right up to the top in it so that you can close it properly. So I always do two strips on my bags just to make double sure that they are well sealed. And then definitely always remember to mark them because you can't see what's inside of them. So I always try to do that as well. Harvest Rate is actually having a sale right now on all of their freeze dryers up to $500 off. It's their biggest sale that they run every year for the entire month of November. So if you have been wanting to get a freeze dryer, now is a really good time to do it. And I do have a link down in the show notes. And if you are considering getting one, I would really appreciate you using my link. So we're gonna put marshmallows and it is, is it the second already? Oh my goodness, it's actually the third. My goodness, I cannot believe that it is the 3rd of November already. Oh my gosh. So we have picked a date for our pantry tour. We're going to be doing it on the 10th and we're going to do it as a premiere. So we'll be in the chat and you'll be able to ask any questions that you have. I'm super excited about that. It is my favorite video of the year to share with you. It's a culmination of everything that we've worked on together since usually we start all of our garden planning starting in November. So for the last 12 months, I have been taking you along on the journey from planting my garden and growing up all of our livestock and harvesting and, and doing all the preserving and all of that. And this is kind of the end result of all of that work and I can't wait to share it with you. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to, we're gonna need that cutting board again. So we'll just set that over there to getting our sauce going on our stove here that we're gonna use for our filling. And then we'll also get our French bread going as well. So I'm going to cook up two pounds of ground beef, our mostly frozen still ground beef. And I turned the wrong element on. This is a fairly new stove and I haven't adjusted to where the dials are because they're op the opposite to the stove that I had before. So I'm constantly turning the wrong element on. We butchered another steer, I think it was four weeks ago now and I needed to make some room in my freezer, in my freezer, so I organized all my freezers, made room, was able to fit in that entire steer, which is awesome. But we also butchered our turkeys about 
four day, five days ago, something like that. And we had seven huge turkeys. So they were a month late to butcher, maybe even a little bit longer, probably could have done them six weeks ago. And they were absolutely enormous. One of them was over 40 pounds. And I was able to fit them all into the freezer except for two. So we actually, night before last, had full out turkey dinner. It was amazing, <laughs> just out of the blue, just because we needed to um, eat one of the turkeys. And then I have that turkey carcass sitting in my roaster oven over here on Martha. And I have onions, garlic, carrots, and celery in there. So that's gonna cook up over the next 24 hours. It smells so good. And I'll probably end up pressure canning some of that. And then I have one more turkey that I have thawed that I'm going to cook up and can all of that meat as well. The rest of the turkeys will just sit in the freezer. We'll be using one for Christmas dinner. We are actually doing a big family Christmas dinner this year with family from out of town, which I'm really excited about. So we need a huge turkey for that. And then the rest of them I'll cook up and can as I have time to do it. So I just brought you over here and now we need to go back over there because we need to make the bread. Okay, so we're gonna put that aside, put our pretty tiles up there, grab our mixer, and we're going to add two cups of warm water to our mixer. So this website is called I Heart Nap Time, which is pretty much the perfect name of a website <laughs> because I am someone who loves a good nap. As you know, if you've been following me for a while, I am a firm believer in the afternoon nap. It's one of the reasons why I can get as much done as I do. I um, also take it pretty easy in the evening. I'm usually in my bed by eight or 8.30 at night and lights out between 10 and 10.30. I do get up really early in the morning because I'm definitely a morning person, but I do love a good afternoon nap. So this um, recipe, let's jump down to the actual recipe here. So I am going to try my best to actually use measuring spoons and measuring cups today, which will make those of you that like it when I do that very, very happy. Normally I just eyeball my measurements, but since I am looking for the perfect recipe, in order to do the recipe justice, I need to make sure that I'm actually following the instructions. Two and a half teaspoons of sugar. I never leave my yeast to sit when I make my own bread, but this one says that I need to let it sit for five minutes. So I'm gonna do that, and then we're going to use five cups of flour. I'm going to use the right measuring cup. So this is a liquid measuring cup, and these measuring cups are meant for dry ingredients. So for the sake of giving this the best chance at being successful, we are going to use the right measuring cups. I use my measuring cups interchangeably, never have an issue, but for the fun of it, we're gonna use the right ones this time. So we're going to do five cups of flour. So we're going to add two and a half teaspoons of salt. So we're just going to let this knead until it is smooth and no longer sticky and pulling away from the sides. So we are going to add a little bit of olive oil into our rising bowl here. And we're going to set our oven at the bread proof option. And we're just going to give this a quick knead by hand. And what we're looking for is some bounce in our bread. I think it could use another minute. Ah, there we go. So now we're gonna roll this in our olive oil. Get, make sure you get your olive oil up the sides of your bowls. And cover that up and let it rise for an hour. Okay, let's go plant our garlic. Seven degrees Celsius. That is 45 degrees Fahrenheit, which for us, for this time of year, is fantastic. Oh, I can give you a quick update on the bunkie. You can see it up there. So it does have 
the roof on it, but not all the shingles and Dan's doing some insulating on it. So because we have been getting some rain, he just put a tarp on it. I don't think I showed you with the ceiling on in the upstairs floor, did I? So we'll just take a quick run up there and I'll show you that before we go down to the garden. We've had to take a bit of a break on building the bunkie because we've been working on getting the pantry all organized. Usually this time of year, it's absolute chaos down there because I'm so busy during the summer that I just kind of throw boxes of stuff down there. So we go through everything, organize it all, take an inventory and everything this time of year, and then it stays clean for most of the winter. It smells so good in here. Let's go upstairs. So our plan is to use this extra space that's at the end here for dresser and storage. And then I am planning on putting the head of the bed over on this side. So we'll put a nice big queen size bed. So that way, when you're leaning up against the wall, you can look out and see this beautiful view. This is just the cutest little cabin ever. And this is the main floor. Nice big deck out the front is the plan. Okay, let's go plant some garlic. Super happy because we got all of our fall cleanup. Well, just about all of it. We still have the top floor of the barn to get through, but all of our sheds have all been cleaned and organized. And all in front of the shop is all clean. The shop's all clean and organized. We use the shop a lot in the winter time. We do have wood heat in there. Dan usually does a lot of our maintenance on all of our equipment during the winter time. And then we have a couple of building projects. We want to build a coffee table this winter and a couple other things. And we use the shop for that. This was the building that sold down on this property for sure. He loved it. This is probably the first year that I have had the garden almost entirely prepped before winter time. So all the beds are all composted. So we'll plant this garlic down here by our other garlic. So I have been trying very hard to make sure that I label everything really well so that I know where everything's planted next year. I always think I'm going to remember and then I never do. So I know that I had a little space at the end of this bed that I didn't plant in. So I will plant our garlic in this spot and it's not frozen at all, which is great. So we're planting these about, I don't know, three or four inches apart, a couple inches deep. Do Chessick red on this end. I'm gonna have to go and make some labels. Oh, these will be just fine. I love having my hands in the dirt so much. Do you know what I can see in here is cow footprints. What the heck? I don't remember a cow getting in here. But there is definite evidence of cow tracks through here. Well, they didn't cause too much damage. I wish I had some more work to do out here because I don't want to go inside. Ah. I do actually have one more task that I could try to squeeze in the garden before the end or before the snow really hits is to get into my raspberry canes and clean out all of this year's cane. So these are canes that produce or raspberries that produce on the second year canes and oh, it smells good in here. And um, I could get in here and clean out all of this year's fruiting canes. They're pretty easy to tell the difference. This is one of this year's fruiting canes and you can see it looks old and doesn't have any color. This year's canes that will be fruiting next year have this red on them. So it is really easy to 
tell the difference. But based on the fact my next week is cre incredibly busy and will probably get snow shortly after that, this is gonna be a project that will likely wait until the spring. So our china asters are done. This was the last hurrah of the garden. The negative 13 that we got killed them off. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna call Dan because <laughs> I need him to help me to cut these big squash in half. Spaghetti squash are one of the longest lasting squashes in storage. I've had them last for a year. They will start sprouting the seeds on the inside, but still edible after a year, which is pretty amazing. I'm excited because I've started working on a series of courses that will be connected to the content that I share with you on my channel. So the first one is going to be a beginning gardener's course. And I'm going to share with you all of the seeds that I purchase each year. There'll be a whole bunch of printables and a ton of information on how to grow each seed. So there'll be a planting guide and all of that. And I'm hoping to have that launching towards the third week, maybe the fourth week of November. And then the next part of these, this course series will be all about growing all of the food, harvesting all of the food. And then we'll do another one on preserving that will have tons of detailed information about how I preserve all of my food. And then we will have the final kind of component in this course series will be all about cooking the food that you harvest and grow and preserve from your garden and not even necessarily your own garden, even from other people's gardens, farmers markets and all that kind of stuff. So I'm really excited. It's just another way that I can share with you the information that I have learned and gleaned over the last, I don't even know how many years, 20 plus years or something like that of growing and harvesting and preserving my own food. You can definitely go through all of my videos and take notes and all of that and learn a lot of the information that I'm going to be sharing in these courses. But the goal of the courses is to compile all of the information in one place to make it a lot easier for you to be able to digest, learn, and then apply it in your own life. Very, very excited about it. If we can cut them like lengthwise this way, so it's kind of like a boat. There's one. So just a sec, that's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That might be enough, just those two squash. If there's extra, it's okay. Yeah, extra is always good. That's true. Okay, so we're gonna scoop all of the guts out of these squash and all of this is going to go to my chickens because they absolutely love it. And I don't know if this is true or not, but I have heard over the years that pumpkin seeds, any type of squash to, or pumpkin seed are really good for combating worms in livestock. So they love them and it could potentially have that added benefit. Okie dokie, we are going to bake these in the oven and just until they start to soften. And then we're going to add our sauce and our cheese to it. This is going to go out to the chickens. So if I didn't say it already, my stove is at 325. I'm feeding lots of teenagers these days, so I have to make a lot because they eat a ton, especially teenage boys, oh my goodness. Okay, we have our ground beef all cooked up over here. I'm just gonna break it up a little bit, but not too much. And then I'm going to make a fairly simple sauce with this. We'll add some peppers, a little bit of celery, onions, tomato sauce, parsley, two nice big cloves of garlic, basil, oregano, a little black pepper, 
a nice big onion. Mm, smelling good. A little olive oil. Little dollop of honey. to cut it in half and flatten this out into a rectangle. And then we're going to roll it into a cylinder. Tuck our ends under. We're going to let these rise for another 60 minutes. If you're gonna use parchment paper on top of your bread, give it some olive oil so that it doesn't stick. So I like using the parchment paper and then putting the dampened towel on the top. Okay, we're gonna let that rise for 60 minutes. So I'll be back with you in around an hour when our bread is ready to go in the oven, our squash are out of the oven, cooling on the counter, and our sauce is done. I'm actually going to be putting all of this together about an hour before we actually eat it, and I'll show you all of that as well, and then I'll show you the finished product. So I'll see you again in a little bit. So all I'm doing here is loosening up the squash just a little bit so that sauce can soak into it. And then I took our meat filling and I filled up all the squash cavities nice and full. Don't be shy when you put this in. Make sure that's filled up right to the very top. Then top it off with a whole bunch of cheddar cheese. You could use mozzarella cheese or any combination of cheeses that you like. I put it in the oven and baked it at 350 till it was nice and bubbly. And then I took our French bread, sliced it into one inch slices, covered it with a nice thick layer of butter and then sprinkled a little bit of garlic powder on the top and baked it in the oven at 350 degrees. All right, friends, we have our squash all cooked up. You can see our other ones over there. Smells absolutely heavenly. One of the benefits of letting it cool off quite a bit is that it sets up so that all of the uh, filling doesn't come out when you cut into it. We have our garlic toasts done over here. So I just took our French bread, cut it all up, put some butter on it and some garlic toast or some, not garlic toast, some garlic and made up some really easy garlic toasts. So let's dig into this and see how it tastes. Must have it on garlic toast. Mm. So darn good. Oh my goodness. This French bread is actually really good. It's not quite as big and fluffy and airy as I was going for. So I'm going to continue on my hunt with finding the perfect bread, but this one's not bad. It's pretty good. If you have not tried stuffed spaghetti squash before, I would highly recommend that you do. It is absolutely delicious and even kids like it. Even kids that don't love squash enjoy this recipe. All right, my friends, that is it for today. I hope you enjoyed the video and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.